So hi, I am Melissa Gray with Calvert Library, and I'm here today to welcome you to a social security update with Diana Varela, a public affairs specialist for the Social Security Administration. Today, you will learn about what's new in social, social security for 2022. Welcome, Diana. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. And uh, on behalf of the Social Security Administration, I would like to say thank you uh, for hosting these programs. We invite the community to actually attend this program. So please, if you are watching today, next time, check the library's schedule because we will have programs with different topics and we would like for you to attend, for your family and friends to come. So please, please do so, share the information and um, thank you so much once again to the Calvert uh, County Library System. Thank you. So I will share my screen and we'll get started. Thank you very much. And um, I just uh, for purposes of this particular program that you are uh, watching today, I would like to let you know that the amounts that we are going to discuss only apply for the year 2022. And of course, at this particular time, it's important that you know how you can actually contact the Social Security Administration to conduct your businesses with us. In the next slide, you will see basically there are two ways to contact Social Security. Next slide, please. The number one option that we advise to you, that you use is visit our website, www.ssa.gov. There are many transactions that you can do online. If you are already getting your social security benefits, you can really manage your benefits online. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But of course, you know, if you prefer to talk to one of our representatives, or if you cannot finish with your business online, then the other way to contact us is please give us a call at the toll-free number, 1-800-772-1213. Our representatives are available to talk to you from Monday through Friday from 8 to 7 p.m., 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. So you have extended hours to contact one of our representatives that will be more than happy to assist you with anything that you need. There is one more option, which is, in some cases, easier, which is you can actually contact your local office by phone. If you take a look at the screen, this is actually a screenshot of our website, the home page. At the top, you will see what it says, menu. If you actually click on the menu, you will have next, a drop down box that you know comes towards your left. One of the options will be contact us. Once you click on contact us, at the bottom of the next page, you will find the office locator. If you provide us with your zip code, we are going to give you the local office phone number. So you have different ways to contact us because we know how important your benefits are to you and your family. And we want to serve you, we want to help you, you know, whenever you need from us. So please, please, when you're trying to conduct your businesses with us, once again, first, try to go online. Second, give us a call at the toll free number or give your local office a call. We are ready to help you. Now, when it comes to conducting businesses with us online, you will need to have 
a My Social Security online account. In the next slide, I have information on My Social Security online account. You can create your online account because if you have an online account, if you are already receiving your benefits, there are many things, almost anything and everything, you can do it online. You can request information from your record. For example, if you need a benefit letter, you can request that online if you have a My Social Security online account. This is taxes season. And of course, you know, if by any chance you don't know where, you, where your 1099 is, then you can request a replacement online. You can request a replacement Medicare card. You can actually change your address, phone number, or direct deposit information. So there are many things that you can do. You can even take a look at your payment history if you are already getting your benefits. And of course, um, for people that are not getting benefits yet, well, there is much to do with an online account because that is the way that workers can get information from their records. You can actually take a look at your earnings record. You can take a look at the benefits that you are eligible for. And more important, the amount of the benefits that we can pay to you in the future. So if you're watching and you do not have an online account yet, please, after you finish watching this video, create your online account. That way you can conduct businesses with us from the comfort of your home. Don't even have to, um, you know, have the phone number for your local office. Now, when people are receiving social security benefits, there are some reporting responsibilities that they have. All social security beneficiaries have reporting responsibilities with the agency. In the next slide, I'm going to list some of the most important reporting responsibilities. And of course, there are some others, but these are the most important. Number one, please, please keep us informed about changes of address, phone number, so we can always have a way to contact you, even including also if you're moving outside the United States. We pay benefits outside the United States. There are just few countries where we have very, um, you know, different limitations of providing benefits to people living in some countries. But for most countries in the world, we will pay you your benefits. But please keep us informed. We need to know how to contact you. Every social security beneficiary from time to time we have a review. We do reviews of social security benefits for different reasons. But chances are that you might have a review. Chances are also that you might not have a review. It depends. Um, what I can tell you is that if we do not have your address and we are doing a review on your record, um, chances are that we might have to suspend benefits until we can correct your record, we can find you, we can do the review. Okay, Social Security Administration does reviews of benefits. So keep us informed about changes of address so you will keep abreast on what's going on with your benefits. And also not just because I review, but also because from time to time, we send you important information that will guarantee that you will continue receiving your benefits without any issues. So keep us informed, please. Um, also, you need to let us know if there are some changes that impact the eligibility to some of the benefits that we provide to you. For example, if you are receiving benefits early before you turn your full retirement age, 
it is okay to work, but you need to let us know because if you're receiving benefits under full retirement age, those earnings might impact your benefits. So you keep us informed and then it will not be a problem for you to continue receiving those benefits. If you are actually receiving supplemental security income, SSI, as per the, it's known, you have more responsibilities because the program is very sensitive in regards to income resources and also living arrangements. And therefore, any changes in your living conditions, in your income or resources must be reported to us within certain period of time. So that way your benefits are not impacted in a negative way. So please keep us informed. You have a responsibility with us. And then that way we will fulfill the responsibility we have to you to provide you those benefits without any issues. Now, let's talk a little bit about scams. In the next slide, we would like for you to be aware that there are scams. And as a matter of fact, there, there are telephone scams um, imposters pretending to be social security employees, and of course, trying to get personal information from you. Remember that I told you before that, yes, we do reviews on the benefits. So it is possible that we contact you. But what I would like for you to know is to make sure that you understand what is the difference between somebody that is an imposter and a true employee of the Social Security Administration. First of all, we are going to send you a letter to let you know if you are due for a review, we are going to either send you a letter to tell you that we are doing this review we are going to schedule a telephone appointment. And during the telephone appointment, we are going to ask you some personal information. Also, it might be that during the review, we need to send you a form that you have to complete and return to us within a certain period of time. We are not going to call you if you don't have a business spending with us. So that is one of the first signs that you have to look for. Another thing that you have to keep in mind is that social security employees will never ask you for money or gift cards or money transfers. We will never threaten you either. We will never tell you that there is a warrant for your arrest. And if you don't you know, resolve an pending issue immediately, somebody is gonna come and arrest you. We will never do that, okay? So please be aware of that. Also be aware that you can always, you can always contact your local office to make sure if that is going to help you to have peace of mind contact your local office and say, so-and-so call me, is that true? They told me I have a pending review. If you are applying for benefits, it is possible that we call you. But if you don't really have any businesses pending with us, we will not. So please, please be aware of that. Um, in some cases, the Office of Inspector General has reported that the phone number that these imposters use, uh, they make you believe that they are actually calling from a government agency. So it's very important. Uh, the, the basic idea to protect yourself is to be aware that these scams are real. These scams can happen uh, by phone, by mail. 
people, be careful, please, with your personal information. In the next slide, there are a you know, few tips that we would like to offer to you. First of all, remember that these threats are real. It scams are real, and many people have lost millions of dollars you know, because they are falling under these imposters. And be cautious all the time. Be aware of the scams. Be cautious when you are providing your personal information. You need to make sure that you are providing the personal information to the person that is entitled to ask you for that. In this case, yes, if we're doing a review, we're going to ask you for that personal information. But you can always have ways to contact your local office to really uh, verify that we are doing a review. And also remember that you have to secure your personal information, not just by phone, but also at home. Make sure that you don't carry your social security card with you at all times. A social security card is not a document of identification. It's not a document that you need to use often. If you think about it, I know that you cannot tell me this, but just think about it. When was the last time that you used your social security card? When was the last time that you had to actually show your card to someone? A social security card, you know, you, you have to show it if you are getting a new employment, maybe. If you are transacting a business with a bank or if you're getting a loan or things like that, well, use it and then put it away, but put it away at home in a secure place where you can always find it. In most cases, just knowing your social security number is enough. So don't carry your car everywhere. Um, if you think about it this way, if you keep your social security card in your wallet, for example, Chances are that in your wallet, you will have your driver's license and, or your state ID, at least. Well, if your wallet is stolen, a person can misuse all of that information in your wallet to steal your identity. Identity theft is the crime that is rising in the country because of those reasons, okay, when personal information is misused. So please, please secure your personal information. If you suspect fraud or if you are a victim of identity theft, please contact the Office of Inspector General at 1-800-269-0271. If you actually visit our Social Security's website, just in the front page, in the home page, you can do a search and you just type how to report fraud. That will bring you to the page where you can actually complete a fraud report to the Office of Inspector General and you can do that online. But if not, once again, you can give us a call and one of our, the representatives from the Office of Inspector will take the information from you. Now, in the next slide, besides scams, be aware of abuse and financial exploitation. And I'm providing here with some other resources for you, and, you know, just in case you get in tons of calls and they are very demanding, you receive a lot of mail, um, please, please, um, if you want to reduce those telemarketing calls or, or mail, you can actually um, visit www.donotcall.com. 
that GOV or call the toll free number 888 328 1222. So you can report that and stop those unwanted calls. Of course, you know, if you or somebody that you know is being abused, please contact the Office of Inspector General or you can contact the National Self Center on Elder Abuse. There are resources and unfortunately, sometimes the abuse and financial exploitation comes from the ones that you love the most. But please get help, get assistance, because no one, no one should be suffering abuse alone. There are resources, there are people that care. Please contact any of those numbers on the screen so you can report, okay? Now, let's continue talking a little bit more about receiving social security benefits and the different options that you have. Um, usually we have a question from beneficiaries asking us, is it possible that I work? I am receiving my benefits, but hey, I want to supplement my income. Is it possible that I work? And the answer is, yes, you can work. We allow all of our beneficiaries to actually work. Happen to be that depending your age and also depending the type of benefits that you get, we will allow you to make different amounts of money, okay, in terms of earnings. So let's talk first about Beneficiaries who are receiving retirement benefits and they are under full retirement age. Well, in the year 2022, if you are getting benefits, but you are not yet full retirement age, meaning you are younger than full retirement age, yes, you can work for as long as you make this year, $19,560. Okay, in the year, we will pay you benefits every month, every month. But now, what happens if you make a little bit more than that amount that we allow you? Well, then we will start deducting some of your benefits. We will not pay you $1 of benefits for every $2 that you go over the amount that we allow you to make. For example, in the year 2022, once again, we will allow you to make $19,560 a year. Well, if you actually end up making, let's say, well, how about, let's say you make $24,560. $24,560. Well, we're going to say, well, you are over the amount that we allow you, okay, by 5000 right? So your excess earnings are 5000 We will not pay you $1 of benefits for every $2 that you cover the amount. So basically, the first $2,500 of benefits we will not pay to you. We are, you are not due. When people are receiving benefits early before full retirement age, we always ask the beneficiary, give us an estimated amount of benefits, of, of earnings, I'm sorry, that you will get next year. So we can pay you the correct amount of benefits and you don't get overpaid. The worst thing that you want to do is tell us, oh, I'm just going to make 19560 this year. Okay, well, year 2022, pass by. And then at the end of the year, you actually made more than what you told us. Well, next year, once you file your income tax return and when you see, we see what, how much you really actually made, guess what? You are already overpaid and we're going to ask you to return any benefits that you were not due. So comes back to reporting responsibilities. You need to let us know. 
keep us informed. Working and receiving benefits under full retirement age is especially important to avoid those overpayments. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Now, the month that you turn your full retirement age, you don't have any limit in the amount of earnings. You can make a million dollars and we will still pay you benefits every month. It doesn't matter. And that starts with the month you turn your full retirement age. Now, the information in the middle is for somebody that is going to be full retirement age this year. But let's say that this person wants to collect benefits from the beginning of the year. But at the beginning of the year, you know, it's not yet full retirement age and it's still working. So what happens then? Well, for the month before reaching full retirement age, there is still a limit. That is the higher limit in the middle. Okay, and once the worker reaches for the time and age, there is no limit. And let me give you an example on this. Let's say that we have a worker who is going to be for the time and age. Let's say that in the month of July. Okay, so July is the for the time and age month. From July and on, no limit. The worker can make as much as he, she wants. Now, but let's say that the worker chooses to start getting benefits from the beginning of the year. Well, the earnings impact you when you are receiving your benefits and working at the same time, and you are not yet for the time and age. But in this scenario, okay, worker wanted to get benefits from the beginning of the year. It is going, the worker is going to be for the time and age until the month of July. So we are going to say to this worker, from the beginning of the year, January through June, the months before your full retirement age, your limit is actually the higher limit in the middle. It is actually going to be considered on a, on a monthly base. So basically the worker will be allowed to make an amount of 4,000, $330 and we will still be able to pay benefits, okay? It, so the year in which you're turning full retirement age, if you wanna get benefits, you know, from the beginning of the year, for the months before is when we're gonna take a look at how much you're making, but remember that the limit of earnings will be much, much higher in that regard. Okay, we're gonna take questions from attendees in just a minute. So let me just give you some other information about some other um, very, very important factors that you need to take into consideration when we talk about uh, working, uh, receiving benefits, and also um, the reporting responsibilities that you have with us. Another thing that I, that I would like to mention to you is in regards to payment of taxes while you are getting your social security benefits. In the next slide, you will see that not all social security beneficiaries have to pay taxes on benefits. That the ones that will pay taxes on social security benefits are actually those who have um, incomes of more than $25,000 for single taxpayers or for couples who have incomes of more than $32,000. So that is one of the things that you need to know in regards to taxes and social security benefits. Please not the threshold that will make you liable to pay taxes over your social security benefits. And even once people file for benefits and we send them a letter of award, you know, saying, hey, your retirement benefits application has been processed. We're gonna start paying you benefits. There are things that you need to consider. One of them is payment of taxes. So, but that's the one, the number one thing that you have to know, what are the thresholds that makes you liable to pay taxes? Um, if you want to know ahead of time in the next slide, you will see what is the basic formula that is used 
to determine whether you're liable to pay taxes or not, okay? If you have income, okay, all of your adjusted income will be considered. If you receive a pension, if you're still working, if you have withdrawals or your 401k plan, all of that is going to be considered. And in addition, you have to add an amount equal to 50% of your social security benefit. And if your combined income is higher than the threshold, once again, $25,000 for single taxpayers, $32,000 for couples, then you're gonna be liable to pay taxes. I can tell you that no social security employee can answer questions about taxes for you. That is why we refer you to the IRS. They are the experts, right? And you can visit their website, irs.gov. You can also give them a call. They have a couple of publications. They even have a tax withholding calculator that you can utilize. So you will know ahead of time or you will make arrangements to pay those taxes along the year. Most beneficiaries ask for a tax withholding from us. So that way from your benefits, you give us permission to withhold federal taxes only. We can only withhold federal taxes and, and we do that. Uh, that is the most convenient way to do it. You have to complete a form that is a W4V. W4V. It is available in the IRS website as well as in Social Security's website. Okay. Now, I would like to know at this point if anybody has any questions or, or material we covered so far. So basically so far we have talked about taxation of benefits, uh, working and receiving benefits, how to contact social security, uh, the best way once again being online, but you can always give us a call. So any questions so far, please let me know. Yes, ma'am, I have several questions. Okay, let's let's start about the topics we have covered so far. Yes, but the first question would okay. be for opening an account. Yes, can your, yes. Can your account be opened prior to actually needing to start the process of receiving benefits? For example, I am not at the maximum age, but I am close mm -hmm. to it. Can that account be okay. started early? And of course, having all the information downloaded. So when I get to that point, it can be started in a timely manner. Yes, please. Try to, to, to create your online account as soon as possible. The reason of that, as I said before, is because if you are not yet receiving social security benefits through your online account, you will get information for your future benefits. You will get, you will have the chance to take a look at your earnings record, make sure that your earnings are correct because we use the earnings to give you eligibility to benefits and also to pay benefits to you. The amount of benefits that we will pay to you is based on your earnings. So please, please try to create in your online account because that's the best way to get information for your future benefits. And also once the time comes for you to file, you know, it's going to be more convenient, safe, and very easy to do to complete the application online. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Next question. You're welcome. Uh -huh. If, for example, I was to start early on receiving mm -hmm. social security benefits, mm -hmm. let's say one year prior to the maximum age and level of receiving full compensation. Sure. Will that amount increase once you hit the maximum age or does that benefit level that when you started prior to your full age, 
remain mm -hmm. the same? Does it increase to that point of what would be your maximum uh, benefits to receive? If you elect to receive reduced benefits, the benefit stays reduced. It doesn't increase at the time that you reach full retirement age. So gotcha. it's a permanent reduction. It's a permanent reduction. That's the reason why it's so important to get the information ahead of time. So you take a look at the options that you have, but of course, you know, having the option is, is not enough. You have to apply different factors to your you know, personal situation to find out when is the best time. Okay, so um, I invite you to um, turn to us next um, month because in the month of March, we will be conducting another uh, program that is going to be on retirement and Medicare. Uh, on retirement only, I'm sorry. And then the following will be Medicare. And that's for people that are not getting benefits yet. Very, very good questions. Thank you so much. Now, what is your next question? You said that you have several. Yes, I do. Thank you. And this will be the third and final for us to go into the next segment. <laughs> okay. Let's say you wait till the maximum age to receive the uh -huh. maximum benefits. Now, yes. I know per the previous two slides ago, 19,560 was at the earlier point up to, up to 51,960. What determines, the, and I'm sure you'll address later on, what determines the level or the amount you receive in benefits? I am used to the old term since I'm just becoming of age, what was uh -huh. Uh -huh. the term called quarters. You had to work so many quarters before you could earn Correct. certain levels of your benefits. Is it based mm -hmm. on the dollar amount as to what you pay into taxes or what is the formula that mm -hmm. puts together what you receive in Social Security benefits these days? Sure. Okay. What I can tell you is that the information we discussed before, the 19560 that is earnings that we will allow a social security beneficiary to have. So prop, you know, that is for people that are actually working and receiving social security benefits at the same time. If you are under your full retirement age, you are receiving benefits and you are under your full retirement age, we will allow you to work and it's okay for as long as you only work and have earnings of more of, of just 19,650. That's the limit of earnings. And uh, any earnings above that amount starts impacting the, the benefits that we will pay to you. That's number one. Now, in regards to the amount of benefits that each worker gets, it depends on the earnings records. For each worker, we calculate the benefits based on um, how many years the worker paid into the social security system. Also, the amount of earnings the worker had over those years. And then age is the other factor that impacts the amount of benefits that we pay. You know, did the worker get the benefits early or started collecting the benefits until full retirement age or even past? full retirement age. So th those are the factors that impact the amount of benefits that each worker gets. So did that answer your question? Pretty much, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, pretty much. What is the, well, the little bit that... <laughs> well, and and well, we do have a calculation. We do have a calculation of the benefits, okay? And, and once again, in the next seminar, we will talk about retirement for people that are not getting benefits yet. Please, please come. But just in case you're unable to come, and remember, these programs are held on the first Tuesday of every month, 1 p.m. But just basic um we do have a publication online that is called how your retirement benefit is figured that provides you with the calculation but basically it's going to be an average of, of your earnings record okay no, that's I got what you. we use to calculate your benefits 
And I appreciate that. But, I figured there would be a calculation okay. or a format that it's structured under. Um, exactly. Whether it be the time factor, years, or the amount of money. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diana. Yes, sir. Oh, you're more than welcome. Um, let's continue. And then you probably have more questions when we cover the next topic, because the next topic, guess what it is? Yes, ma'am. Family benefits family benefits. This is probably one of the most important factors that people not getting benefits and also people getting benefits need to consider in regards to the social security benefits. Um, we provide benefits to family members and we provide benefits when the worker is deceased. Of course, we have survivors benefits, but we also have benefits for family members of workers that are alive but the worker must be receiving either retirement or disability benefits. Usually when I do seminars, people tend to believe that we only pay benefits to family members when the worker is deceased, and that is not so. So let's, I have a comparison chart, so this is, you know, um, explain, you know, more in, um, with more details. So I have a comparison chart that shows what are the similarities and also the differences between the two benefits when the worker is alive or the worker is deceased. So let's talk first when the worker is alive. That is the column that you see towards your left. So if the worker is alive and, and it must be and, if the worker is receiving already either retirement or disability benefits, we can pay benefits to spouses. The requirements for spouses will be that a spouse of any age with a child in care can get benefits. And Social Security defines, you know, the definition of child in care is a spouse that has a child under the age of 16 or a child that is disabled. It can be a disabled adult child, but if the child became disabled before the age of 22, that will qualify a spouse of any age to get benefits under the worker's record. We also provide benefits to spouses, of course, at the age of 62, but 62, remember, is a reduced benefit and even if the spouse is working, we are allowed to work, but only making a small amount of earnings, okay? And of course, we pay benefits at full retirement age. Always the advantage, if a worker can wait until full retirement age, the advantage of waiting until full retirement age is that at full retirement age, you get 100% of your benefits. And also, we allow you to work and have any amount of earnings. Always think about it this way. Anytime you apply for benefits before your full retirement age, any benefits that you apply, you're taking a look at a reduction, permanent reduction, and also, yes, we allow you to work, but only have a small amount of earnings in the year. Okay, so think about it that way. Now, how much can your spouse get on your record? We pay benefits to spouses equal to an amount equal to 50% of the worker's full retirement age amount. Benefits that we pay to family members are in addition to the benefits we pay to the worker. We don't take anything from the worker to pay benefits to a spouse that qualifies for benefits. So we pay the worker first, and in addition, if the worker has family members that we can pay benefits to, we pay them too. So when the worker is alive, we use the amount that represents full retirement amount, 50%, an amount equal to 50% of that amount can go to a spouse. Now, let's take a look at the survivors benefits. That's the column you see towards your right. For survivor's benefits, uh, we can still pay benefits to a spouse of any age with a child in care. Okay, so maybe a younger spouse that had 
have small children in their care. But we can also pay benefits to a spouse that is 60 years old and even 50 years old, but disabled. And of course, at surviving spouses that are full retirement age. Also take a look at the amount of benefits, the rate of benefits that we can pay. 71.50 to a spouse that is 60 years old, or it can even be 100% of what the worker was getting, okay, 100%. So there are different factors that we take into consideration to find out who can get 100% of the deceased worker's benefits. Um, but the important thing and what I would like for you to know is that it is possible. So. If you are getting benefits now, okay, of course, one of the reporting responsibilities that you have is that to let us know if your spouse passes away before they knew. You have to report, but also what we will do is we will take a look at how much your spouse was getting, how much you are getting, if you're getting benefits on your own record, it is possible that you can get benefits on your deceased spouse's record if your deceased spouse's record had higher earnings than yours and your spouse was getting a higher amount. Okay, we'll go over a few scenarios on what we do with benefits to family members, to spouses when the worker is alive or deceased, if both the spouses have work. Okay, so, but we do pay benefits to spouses. In the next slide, you will see that we also pay benefits to divorced spouses. For divorced spouses, there are other requirements. The other requirements are that the spouse was married, the divorced spouse was married to the worker for 10 years. It's single at the time of application. And they, you know, got divorced you know, two years uh, before. And of course that the divorce spouse is at least 62 years old. The benefits that we can pay to a divorce spouse will not impact at all the benefits that we pay to a current spouse if the worker has uh, remarried. So we can pay the worker first, the spouse, the current spouse, and a divorced spouse if there is a divorced spouse in the record. Um, next slide shows you, you know, as I said before, that benefits for a spouse can start as early as 62. But of course, you know, 62 is early retirement. If um, a spouse starts benefits at early age, uh, there will be a reduction and the reduction will be permanent. So this is a chart that shows you, you know, depending on the year that you were born, uh, what is your full retirement age, what is considered your full retirement age, and then the reduction that a spouse will take if they apply for benefits early, okay? Now, um, besides the spouses, okay, we pay benefits to children. But what I would like to do next is do a summary of a spousal benefits, and then we will continue talking um, about children's benefits. Let's do a summary so that way you can understand a little bit what we do in regards to spouses benefits with different scenarios. Um, and that way you can have a better understanding of what you or your spouse can be entitled to. Okay, so in the next slide, let's do a summary and we go over uh, some scenarios as well. Okay, so first of all, okay, um, for the spouses, remember that I said that the worker must be receiving retirement or disability benefits. So for a spouse to get benefits, spousal benefits under the workers, the spouse must be already receiving benefits. The only exception is for a divorced spouse. 
a divorced spouse can file independently from the worker. The worker can be remarried, not filing, working for as long as the worker is 62 years old, a divorced spouse can file independently. The current spouse, current spouse has to wait. Okay, so that's the first thing that you need to know. Other thing is, remember that the benefits that we pay will be an amount equal to 50% of the worker's full retirement age amount. And that doesn't impact the worker at all. So let me give you a scenario on this. Let's say that we have a couple. In this couple, um, there is only one worker. Only one, one worker. The other spouse was a stay-at-home spouse. Okay, well, if the worker is going to get $2,000 in benefits, a stay-at-home spouse that never worked outside the household is going to get $1,000. Total family benefits, $2,000 for the worker, $1,000 for the spouse, that is full retirement age. Total family, $3,000. If that spouse files for benefits early, then there will be a reduction of that benefit. Okay. The other bullet says, if the spouse's own benefit is less than 50% of the workers, benefits will be combined. Okay. Let's say that in this scenario, we're gonna have a couple. Both of them work, but one of them only work part-time. Well, you had less earnings in your record, we're gonna pay you less benefits. Okay, so let's say that the spouse with the higher earnings record will get $2,000 at full retirement age. The spouse with the lower earnings record will get only 500. Okay, well, you work less, we're gonna pay you less in benefit. Now, for this spouse who had a lower earnings record, we're gonna have to make a comparison. Because by law, we have to pay that spouse the higher amount that he or she can get. And in this scenario, if this spouse can only get $500 on his or her own record because he, had lower, he or she had lower earnings, but we compare that on the, the other spouse, we can pay 1,000. That's what we will pay. It will be like telling you, well, on your record, because you have lower earnings, you can only get $500. But on your spouses who had higher earnings, we can pay you $1,000. So which one would you rather get? The $1,000, right? So that's what we will pay. We will still pay you the $500 you are due on your record, another $500 from your spouse's record in this scenario to pay the higher amount. We do these all the time when the worker is alive and you are filing for benefits or your spouse is filing for benefits, we have to make this comparison. And we do this if the worker is deceased. If you and your spouse are getting benefits, one of you predeceases the other, please let us know so we can take a look at and find out if you will be eligible for a higher amount. There is one more scenario. Let's say that we have a couple, both of them work, had the, almost the same amount of earnings, probably, you know, that's my scenario, for example. My spouse and I both work, had about the same amount of earnings, about the same age. So let's say that he's gonna get $2,000 on his record and I will get 1,800 on my record. Hey, for him, it's better to get his 2000 For me, better to get my 1800 right on my record. So that's what we will get. If anything happens to him before he was getting a higher amount, then it's possible that I get that higher amount. There will be an adjustment. We do this all the time. Okay, so please keep this in mind. Okay, um, next, let's talk about those benefits for children, as I said. Okay, very important because we do provide benefits to children. In the next slide, please. Uh, children that are under age 18 
for children between 18 and 19 in full-time attendance in high school, but we also provide benefits to children who are disabled and became disabled before the age of 22. Same requirements when the worker is alive or deceased. Um, when the worker is alive, we pay an amount equal to 50%. So if worker is getting 2,000, a disabled adult child is gonna get 1,000. And um, when the worker is deceased, we actually pay a higher rate of benefits, 75%, okay? Uh, let's talk a little bit about Medicare before we run out of time. Uh, Medicare is very important because basically in the next slide, you will see Medicare is the health insurance, it's the health insurance program. Um, and um, Medicare has um, um, benefits for people that are 65 years old and also people that at any age um, are disabled and receive disability benefits for two years. Everybody, every worker with any medical condition has to wait two years. The only ones that do not have a 24 month uh, waiting period are those diagnosed with Lou Gehrig disease. We also provide Medicare for those workers that at any age are suffering from kidney failure and are on dialysis for three months. And Medicare is very comprehensive, provides coverage for everything, you know, hospitalization, doctor's visits, um, supplies like diabetic supplies, medical equipment, prescriptions, okay? And people under Medicare have a couple of options in regards to the coverage. You can enroll in a Medicare original plan or you can enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. The difference is that the original plan is divided in parts, but A for hospitalization is premium free. You don't have to pay, but there are deductibles and copays. Um, it has the part B. Uh, you have to pay a premium per person per month. So if you and your spouse have Medicare, you have to pay the monthly premium every month. And you also have the prescription plan. Under the original plan, you can take all of the parts at the same time, but you can take some parts now and some others for later. Okay, so that's the original plan. And since it doesn't cover for all expenses, um, Medicare beneficiaries can um, get a Medigap policy, like a supplemental policy. Uh, the Medicare Advantage plans are actually private companies. They are lower cost plans and um, most of them are HMOs and might provide additional, some plans provide additional coverage for hearing, vision, dental that the Medicare original plan does not cover, okay? In the next slide, you will see um, information about the Medicare Part B premium that is $170.10 this year. Premiums usually change from year to year, but that's the standard premium. People who pay, who had higher Medicare, uh, I'm sorry, higher incomes will pay a higher Medicare premium because besides paying the premium, you must pay a surcharge and it's dependent on income. So for people who have incomes of more at 91,000 for single taxpayers or 182,000 for couples, then um, the premiums go slightly higher because of the store charge. Once the person is on Medicare, we will always take a look at your income. We usually take into consideration the income two years before. For example, in the year 2022, we will take the income for the year 2020 if that is already posted by the IRS or 2019. If you heard, you know, IRS is still kind of uh, behind in some tax returns. So, uh, but know that as a fact, we will always take a look at your income um, to determine if you pay the standard premium or you will have a surcharge. You don't have to give us information on that income but you need to let us know if actually something happens, if you had what we call a life changing event, an event in your life that changed your income from what it was two years before. Examples of these life changing events can be 
you divorce or your spouse is deceased or two years ago you were working, now you retire. Okay, so you will get a letter and, and let you know uh, the amount of premiums that you will get and what to do in case you need to let us know you had a life-changing event, okay? Um, next slide, please. Um, I invite you to, to, to visit medicare.gov because that provides you every year with, if, if you remember you're receiving benefits now, Medicare benefits, you used to get a Medicare and you booklet. Now it is only available if you actually request the hard copy, but it is available online. So you can get information in regards to a specific coverage under Medicare. Um, what are the deductibles, the co-pays. Also there is a section on resources. If you need to make decisions about Medicare, um, you can do uh, that, get resources, uh, talk to volunteers that can help you. And I encourage you to create also a Medicare account, online account, so that way you can manage your Medicare uh, benefits very easily. Uh, next slide, just in case you or someone that you know has lower income and resources, I would like to let you know that there is extra help. Extra help assist Social Security and Medicare beneficiaries to have lower income and resources. And the assistance that we provide, assistance that we provide is um, assistance with the payments of the prescription plan card, premiums, deductibles, and copays. It is based on income and resources. So I'm going to provide you with the income and resources, but please know there is extra help. And you can actually file for this benefit, um, of course, online, it's available online, or you can give us a call. We can send you the form um, to, for you to apply for Medicare. And also know that through the state, under the Medicaid program, Beneficiaries with lower income and resources can get assistance with the payments of the Part B, the medical portion of the Medicare benefit. Okay, uh, next slide, please. These are the resources for people that actually are able to um, get assistance with the Medicare prescription plans, low income subsidy limits. Um, as, you, as you can see, we're gonna take into consideration the income and also resources. The income is basically the uh, monies that you receive, either it comes from your social security benefits, your pensions, uh, the resources of course is going to be things that you own, uh, for example, like bank accounts. Okay, so you are still able to get um, bank accounts for as long as your resources are under the limit, uh, you might still be able to qualify for the low income subsidy. Um, next slide, please. Um, I was telling you that there are resources in case you need to um, get assistance to make Medicare decisions. You can contact your local services office and ask for a state health insurance program. They have volunteers that have been trained by Medicare to help you when the enrollment periods come, to help you when you need to make medical decisions in regards to Medicare. Are you going to be better off on a Medicare original plan or the Medicare Advantage plans will be a better option for you. Please contact your state health insurance program. They have a website, uh, keeptacenter.org. You can visit that and it will ask you for the zip code where you live or the location where you live. So it will give you the information on your local um, a state health insurance program representative. You can also call them at 1-800-243-3425 uh, if you live in Maryland to get the assistance that you need. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, 
very briefly, it, somebody already asked what is the calculation in regards to social security benefits, because sometimes we get a question, well, um, my neighbor gets more benefits than I do. So why is that? <laughs> As I said before, for each person, we calculate benefits based on the persons or the workers on earnings record. I can tell you that probably for all of us, the benefits will be different because as I said before, the benefits depend on number one, how many years you work, number two, the earnings you had, and three, what is the age that you're getting your benefits, that you're starting your benefits. These are actually the first three steps that we use in the calculation of social security benefits. In the first step, we're gonna take a look at all of the years you work, all of them. We will increase those years to current value and for each year is a different um, you know, percentage that we increase them because there are certainly changes in wage levels over time. Um, and then we are going to select 35 years of earnings. We are going to use the years in which you had the highest amount of earnings. For most workers, they are at the end of our careers. If you start working and continue working steadily, you know that your, your, your latest years will be the higher years of earnings. And, and also, if we have workers that don't have 35, hey, some of those years will be in zero because it's an average of 35. So after we have a monthly earnings, we will um, apply a formula and that's in a sense how, how we calculate benefits. And, and I said before, I invite you to visit us online because we have a publication called How Your Retirement Benefit is Figured. Okay, um, next slide, very, very briefly. Um, we have, um, after you know March 2020, um, all new retirement claims, disability claims, um, applicants have to give us information about advanced designation of representative pays. A representative pay is a person that Social Security Administration will appoint to actually manage benefits for a beneficiary. We recognize the fact that some of our beneficiaries, because we even pay benefits to children, they cannot manage their own benefits. So all applicants under the age of 18 must have a representative payee. But also we recognize the fact that some of our beneficiaries who are 18 and older might not be able to handle their own benefits. Um, and they must have a representative pay. So by advanced designation, the applicant actually tells us of three people they, that we can consider, that we can contact in case the person later on becomes unable to handle their own affairs and benefits with us. Um, next slide basically is just uh, an invitation for you to visit us online, www.ssa.gov. Anything and everything that, that you heard from me in, during this uh, recording, it's available online and much more. Because online, we have Facebook and Twitter. You can actually become a friend of us in Facebook of Twitter, if you like those social media channels, we you can ask us questions. Of course, you know just general questions. Remember, no personal information. You have to protect your personal information. So, no social security numbers on Facebook or Twitter, please. Just general questions. We will answer those questions. We will provide you resources. We are actually in Instagram. We have YouTube videos. You want to get more information and updates on social security well you can register we have blogs and newsletters that you can register so you will always keep abreast with information about your benefits or your future benefits okay 
I thank you very much for watching this presentation and I invite you to continue attending the presentations and the programs that um, we are um, hosting in collaboration with Calvert County Library System. So thank you once again to Calvert County Library System for inviting us. Thank you for attending these programs. And on behalf of all of us at Social Security, please stay safe and well. Take care of yourselves, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, for sharing that wealth of information. We appreciate you helping our customers navigate the changes in Social Security for 2020. 2022. Our next program is March 1st from 1 to 2, where we will learn all about Social Security retirement, such as eligibility requirements, family benefits, different options, and the application process. So please sign up for that, and uh, we'll see you on March 1st at 1 o'clock. Thanks again. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Do we have one more minute? Mm -hmm. Did you stop the recording? Okay, I just wanted to ask Mr. Gray if he has any questions. Of course I do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I figure, but I don't know because usually on Zoom it's like a time. No, they're time very, limited, they're very so. quick. Using the okay. example you gave, you and your husband, without being specific, of course. Mm -hmm. Both of you are working, and if. Yes a couple is legally married are both entitled mm -hmm. to their social security benefits upon full age receipt or did i hear you say that you have to defer to one or the other it is always one or the other always the higher so in that scenario once again my husband is going to get two thousand dollars on his record right i will get 1800 on my own record so basically the comparison for me will be, I can either get my own $1,800 on my record or only a thousand on my husband's record. I, that doesn't make sense, right? Why will I only get 1,000 as a spouse if I have my own that is 1,800? We will always choose the higher benefit for you. That's why we have to make that comparison by law. How much can you get on your own? How much on your spouses? We'll pay you one of the two, always the higher. So in this scenario, it will be better for my husband to get benefits on his record so he will get his 2000. It will be better for me to get benefits on my record. I will get my 1800 for a total benefit between his benefits and my benefits of 3800. Does so, that make sense? Yes, so you you both do get them. There's not like what I would call a marriage penalty being that if two <gasps> individuals who weren't married, they both get theirs, yeah. but a married couple doesn't. The other quick question, please. Uh, a spouse receiving benefits upon your death. And I know when the one mm -hmm. slide said 10 years prior to death, obviously, can you change? Remember, just let me just tell yeah. you this. The 10 years marriage requirement is just for the divorce spouse. Gotcha. For the divorce part. But divorce spouse. Yeah. Thank, thank yeah. you for, for that. The current, yeah. For survivors, it's only nine months. Okay. Yeah. All different benefits have different durations of marriage. Like for example, for the current spouse is one year, for the divorce spouse, 10 years, and for survivors, nine months. Okay, and, and thank you for that clarification, but it still runs the parallel of the question. Divorced or let's say divorced then, can the worker mm -hmm. change who is gonna be the recipient of their social security benefits? The answer is no. Because for as long as the divorce spouse, for example, meets the requirement, we're going to pay that divorce spouse. Gotcha. For as, as long as the current spouse meets the requirement, we're going to pay that current spouse too. Okay. Gotcha. Great. Well, Diana, thank you again very much for your insightful information. I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you yep. next month. 
Oh, please. I'm looking forward to see you. And please bring all of your friends, Mr. Gray. I, I maybe shall do that. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care. And thank you once again. Nice talking to you, seeing you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.